QSO Today, Episode 227, Ricky Klein, K7NJ. This episode of QSO Today is sponsored by ICOM America, makers of the finest HF, VHF, and UHF transceivers for every level of amateur radio operator. Visit ICOM at www.icomamerica.com forward slash amateur to update your holiday wish list. And by QRP Labs, makers of the QCX single band transceiver kit and a host of other QRP radio kits and parts for the ham radio builder. Click on the link to QRP Labs in this week's show notes page. Please support the QSO Today podcast by supporting these fine sponsors. Welcome to the QSO Today podcast. I'm Eric Guth for Z1UG, your host. Ricky Klein, K7NJ, has a long and interesting ham radio career, from humble beginnings in Las Vegas, Nevada, as a teenage ham, to his current QTH on over 40 rural acres in Utah. I was introduced to Ricky by a friend here in Israel, who knows that Ricky also lives here in Israel part-time, in the village of Na'ale, overlooking Israel's coastal plain and the Ben-Gurion Airport. K7NJ shares his perspective as an amateur radio operator who frequently works from either side of the world, likes to chase DX, and operate contests in this QSO today. K7NJ, this is Eric, 4Z1UG. Are you there, Ricky? Yes, 4Z1UG, K7NJ. Thanks for joining me on the QSO Today podcast. Can we start at the beginning of your ham radio story? When and how did it start for you? Well, it started sort of simultaneously with two things happening. When I was 11, 12 years old, Uncle had a short wave receiver in his den, and he used to let me play around with that. He was into listening to short wave broadcasts, you know, uh, commercial type stuff. And I always seemed to end up listening on the ham bands, which tremendously interested me. And that sort of stayed passive, you know, I just play with that when I went over to visit him. And then about the same time, in Boy Scouts, I tried. Uh, I got the, uh, the radio merit badge, and that introduced me to amateur radio, and I thought that was really, really neat. And at that point, eventually, I told my scoutmaster, I said, you know what, I just want to do ham radio and uh, probably be dropping out of scouting, which I did. And then it was all systems go from then. Now, where did you grow up? I grew up uh, mostly in Las Vegas, Nevada, some of the time in, in California. I actually got my first ham ticket when I was in California. And when did you get your first ham ticket? What, what year was it? The license is on the wall here. It's uh, dated uh, uh, July of 1956. And was that the, the novice license? Yes, yes. I was KN6, Texas Hotel, November. And how long were you a novice? Just for one year. It was only good for one year at that time and not renewable. So. Uh, it would have been less than a year because uh, I was continuously in amateur radio. So I don't remember exactly when I passed my, my general exam, but sometimes towards the end of that. And, and you say you were in Southern California. Where were you in Southern California? I was in the uh, Hollywood area of Los Angeles. Oh, that would have been an exciting place in 1956. <laughs> I suppose. I was uh, just doing my thing and going to junior high school and trying to learn more about ham radio. There weren't any ham radio clubs that I knew of. And, uh-huh. Uh, and where, then, where did you go to where did you go to Fairfax High School there in Hollywood? No, no, that's where my mother went. Uh, uh-huh. I, I went to Bancroft Junior High School. Uh, and then my family moved to Las Vegas and then, then I entered Las Vegas High School later on. That's how I became a seven. Were you uh were you active in the uh, Las Vegas Amateur Radio Club? Yes, I was at the time. Yeah, yeah, I was. Yeah. My call, my call then uh, was K seven Alpha Delta Delta. The call has since been reissued to a very capable fellow who, who interesting enough, uh, has the same interest in ham radio that I've always had, and it's sort of a way to keep the tradition going. I send him all kinds of memorabilia uh, from time to time. Do you remember your first rig? Yes. Yes, it was a World Radio Labs Globe Scout, and it ran, as I recall, about 65 watts. And the receiver? The receiver was a National NC240D, and it uh, was manufactured before we received 15-meter ham privileges, and 15 meters was my favorite band. And one time I wrote in, I think there was a column in Popular Electronics about ham radio that I 
wrote a little something and sent it into them, just a small paragraph. And I got a response from somebody saying, well, how in the world do you use the MC240D on, on 15 meters? Because it only had about uh, maybe a quarter inch to, or, or three eighths of an inch of, of, uh, of, of dial distance to cover the whole 15 meter band. It was, uh, fortunately, it had a very uh, uh, the precision uh, uh, knob and dial. So my response to him was, well, I just tuned very, very gently. <laughs> Cover the, <laughs> you can imagine covering the whole 15 meter band and three eighths of an inch of, of dial distance. That was it. <laughs> and and how did you upgrade from there? You were a novice in Las Vegas for a while, and then you you upgraded there. Yeah, I took the, took the general exam. The FCC would would come up there several times a year, and I took the general exam there. Uh, or, uh, you know what? That was the extra. Uh, the general was uh, with a volunteer examiner at the time. That's right. Uh huh. Now I have to tell you, um, I, I'm sure that there are people who are listening who may or may not remember Las Vegas in the 50s. I I remember it in the early 60s, and there was not a lot to um, to write home about uh, in Las Vegas in those days. Uh, what's your most unusual memory of Las Vegas in the in the 50s? Actually, my family moved there in 1949, so, so yeah, the 50s is. Uh, my most unusual memory growing up there? No, my parents remember there was a bakery and a gas station. Las Vegas wasn't nearly the city it is today. No, no, I think there was only about 25, 30,000 people in the city proper, and, and, and not too many more in the whole metropolitan area, if you can call it that. My father was a chiropractor, and there was only three of those in town at the time. And uh, just I think one of uh, my most memorable things isn't about Las Vegas, but it was about something that happened in Las Vegas. <laughs> and that was uh, my father, when I, when I was, uh, say, six, seven years old, wanted to teach me the value of money. So he gave me a dollar, but he gave it to me in all these different coins so that I would see, you know, pennies and nickels and dimes and uh, maybe a quarter. I, I forget exactly the combination, but that was uh, one of the most memorable, memorable things then. And, uh, when I think back of, of his office, which was in an old, uh, 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 actually a house, on a, a residential house on a, on a fairly large lot uh, right in the center of town. Today, there's a big uh, parking garage there, you know, like five or six stories. Um, but uh, I think maybe one of the most memorable things was just going with my family up to Mount Charles, which is a nearby mountainous uh, a vacation type area and having barbecues and in the winter we'd go up there and then uh, I had a little sled and, and go on that and, uh, that was it mostly uh, nothing special nothing special about the town itself really did ham radio play a part in the choices that you made for your education and career oh most definitely it uh, it sets a stage for everything uh, so, uh, soon after I uh, got my license I was speaking to one of my friends and told him, uh, you know, this is really, really cool. I'm really, in, really enjoying this. And I want to be the best possible ham radio operator that, that I could ever be. And he said, well, if you want to do that, you have to learn a lot about electronics. You'll have to, you have to become an electronic technician. And then he added, but if you really want to know about electronics, then you'll have to become an electrical engineer. So that's it. When I was about 12 or 13 years old, I decided that I would be going into electrical engineering, which I did. So that's all credited to ham radio. It wouldn't have happened had it not been for ham radio. And where did you go to school? Uh, University of Nevada. Uh, I started in Las Vegas, which uh, the University of Nevada system covered both uh, uh, Las Vegas and, and Reno. And anything I did in, in Las Vegas was directly accepted in the Reno campus. Uh, so I started out in Las Vegas, finished the first two years, and then transferred to Reno, and then uh, graduated from there. And, and then you went on to do graduate work? I did a little bit of graduate work, not uh, not more than a few courses. I never pursued it too much. I, uh, when I went to work for RCA, uh, I took a few courses at University of Pittsburgh uh, in uh, such uh, things as, as amplifier design, things like that. I see. But you went to um, work for RCA in the Pennsylvania area, right? Uh, near, um, near Pittsburgh. Uh, actually, yeah. new, in Pittsburgh. Not in uh -huh. Pittsburgh. It was in a little, little town called Meadowlands, which is 
uh, maybe famous for having a racetrack there. And, um, I went to work for them. Uh, my first, uh, my, actually, I accepted the job there. Uh, it, it was my lowest offer uh, that, that I, I was made by several companies at college. And the reason I took it is because it was the closest to ham radio. It was working in their broadcast transmitter uh, design and manufacturing facility there. And, uh, I was, you know, really, really happy to be uh, working with uh, ham radio. I partner to be working with transmitters, and that sort of thing. So uh, that that's that was the first job. Was well, there any practical experience there that you've actually applied to ham radio? That I applied to ham radio? Yeah, did, have you built a you know, rolled your own uh, um, uh, kilowatt amplifier? Uh, yes, uh, yeah, 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 for sure. Uh, I learned. Uh, while I was there, uh, uh, the, the importance of the right layout and, and, and you know to minimize lead lanes and, and what parasitic uh, capacitances and, duct and inductances uh, would be caused by and how to minimize them, all kinds of things like that. Useful practical information. Right, and they they were building a broadcast transmitters, so you're talking tens of thousands of watts. Oh yes, uh, uh, somewhere fifty thousand watts. The the final amplifier stage, you could actually walk in like, like, a, like a cabinet. And, uh, uh, yeah, and the, 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 the coax was like, if I remember the size was three inches or three and a quarter uh, inch uh, uh, solid uh, copper <laughs> pipes. It looked like a, a part of a water installation. It's a, just an amazing thing. Uh, I did uh, work on, uh, on developing a, a cavity for a uh, 15 or 20 kW amplifier. It used a, a developmental tube at the time. And after I left, uh, several years later, I ran into one of the fellows at uh, Dayton Hamburg, and, and he told me that that uh, cavity, uh, that final amplifier stage cavity that I developed turned into a, <clears throat> into a product line for them, and they eventually marketed that. So uh, that was interesting. And I did some work. Uh, Combining two one kilowatt uh, broadcast stations, I combine them into a two kilowatt unit, which you know, it's not that much more power, but it gives them the redundancy and reliability. If they should have a problem with one transmitter, then the other one would still work at half, half, half of the total power. So that was good. I worked for them for two years. <coughs> now, we were introduced um, by one of my friends here in Israel. Um, what's your Israeli connection? Because you've, you've actually spent some time uh, living and working here. Yes. Um, well, when I graduated high school, I didn't know what to do with myself. I didn't feel ready to go into college. And my grandmother, who was uh, devoted most of her life uh, to supporting Israel, and in her old age, she finally moved there, moving from Los Angeles to, to, uh, to Israel. And when I finished uh, high school, she uh, told me, well, if you're coming visit me and promise to stay at least six months and I'll send you a round trip uh, boat ticket. So I took her up on that offer and uh, I was there. Uh, and the six months uh, was sort of funny because I actually stayed for two years. <laughs> um, I brought my uh, a rig. I had a, I think it was an ICO uh, 723, remember the number, it had a single 6146 in the final. I believe it was just a CW rig, which was fine. And uh, I picked up in New York City a Drake 1A receiver. So I had quite a nice uh, station. And I, I had a single 813 amplifier that I had acquired and uh, shipped that from Las Vegas all the way to Israel. It came in a big crate. And, um, I had some other equipment uh, with me. But that was a, that was a station for the most part. I had a little... Uh, RS6, uh, it's uh, sometimes called a spy radio. It has uh, four little boxes, and I, I could use that temporarily, too, uh, until I got everything in order with my uh, Israeli call sign. So that was that was great. Okay, so you were here for two two years. When was that? That was uh, 1960 to 1962. Uh-huh. Were there any people here that... Um that influenced you in terms of uh, maybe the direction that you were going to take professionally, but also um, the direction that you would take in ham radio? 
Uh, no, I don't think so. I was just, uh, I was a loner. I was, I was away in a kibbutz. And uh, uh, the only people who I met, the radio hands, who were good friends of mine, who, uh, Hanan, uh, 4X4, Mike Bravo, and Hanina, 4X4, Mike Uniform. Hanina, unfortunately, has since passed away. Uh, and I did uh, spend a little bit of time they invited me to go on an expedition to the Dead Sea, and we uh, we spent maybe four or five days there at the, let's see, the license, the call sign was 4X5 Delta Sierra, 4X5 Dead Sea. That was maybe 1961 when we did that. We were at- uh, Kind of an expedition. It was, the, it was, yeah, it was an expedition. Uh, we were at, at Dome in Hebrew. In, in, in English, you would call that Sodom, I guess, S-O-D-O-M. Uh-huh. Oh, that's very cool. Now, the reason I asked was um, I, I was just curious about um, what, you know, kind of ham radio activity was happening in the early 60s in Israel. Uh, in an early version of the QSO Today podcast, I had um, uh, Amnon Bargiora, 4X1 <coughs> Delta Fox, uh, on, and he had talked about, um, you know, the very early beginnings of ham radio in Israel. And uh, it seems to me that you're, if you were here in the early 60s, that you were kind of part of, uh, at least um, for the time that you were here, uh, a part of that um, that evolution. Yes, uh, there was <clears throat> everything, all the, I think just about all the transmitters were home brew. So there were very few, uh, there were some that had uh, commercial gear, but uh, probably because of the cost, uh, it was all home brew. Uh, and I, I wasn't able to ever get to a meeting at the radio club, but I uh, spent some time with uh, Hanan uh, before 4X4 MV. Uh, we entered a few contests together, and I came over. We used his station. And, uh, that, was, that was exciting. Uh, everybody was uh, everybody was interested in the, in the equipment that I brought because it was commercial equipment, except for the homebrew amplifier. So it was... Uh, uh, it was it was really a, an interesting period, uh, and that it had, when, when I think of what ham radio is today in Israel, I mean, in those days, like I said, everything was homebrew, uh, making making your own antennas, and, and uh, I suppose it probably started up to, similar to, to the way things started up in the states in that sense. Yeah, I think that's probably true. Although uh, it was a much smarter, smaller market than than um, than America. Now, after that, um, are you a contester? Yes, most definitely. That's that's uh, pretty much uh, the concentration of all I'm doing in ham, ham radio today. I, I was a DXer, and uh, when I was in Israel, uh, uh, I, I was also a contester and a DXer. And I got to the number one honor roll spot from 4X4 MJ, and then when I moved uh, back to the States uh, in uh, 2004, I decided that... Uh, I'm not going to start all over again on DXCC. I, I dislike paperwork and, ch and chasing after the yeah, cards. When you got back to the States, what happened? I got back to the States. I, um, I decided I'm not going to start all over again on DXCC. I mean, reached the top at one point. So uh, I concentrate all of my uh, efforts in the direction of contesting right now. Contesting it. Uh, then I, uh, I do enjoy just... Uh, General actually on CW. Uh, I'm a member of a couple of uh, CW clubs and uh, do a lot in, in that area too. But the main, the main push is towards contesting. And now this message from ICOM America. As we get past the contest season and into the holidays, it's now time to put an ICOM radio on your holiday wish list. This week, I want to talk about the ICOM IC7300. The ICOM IC7300 has changed the paradigm for the way that an entry-level HF rig is designed. The IC7300 is an all-mode HF transceiver that operates in all of the HF bands 160 through 6 meters. The IC7300 is an RF direct sampling receiver with 15 discrete bandpass filters, an internal antenna tuner, a front panel SD memory card slot, and a large 4.3-inch color touchscreen display that provides an easy access to the feature set in this transceiver. It also has a real-time spectrum scope. This rig also has a USB interface to connect this transceiver to your PC to operate your favorite logging or digital mode software. 
While I did say that the IC7300 is an entry-level rig at the beginning of this message, the IC7300 is an amazing value for any amateur radio operator, including you, who wants to complement the existing rigs in your shack. Let's face it, the ICOM IC7300 is fun to operate, has a small footprint, and can even be remote-controlled using software and an external computer. The truth is, I just purchased an IC7300 for its incredible value, feature set, and performance. This is my first new rig in many years. So if you're looking to have the most state-of-the-art HF transceiver for an incredible price, then check out the ICOM IC7300 at your ham radio dealer near you, or go to www.icomamerica.com amateur to find out more about this amazing rig. And when you finally make that holiday purchase, tell the dealer that you heard it here about the ICOM IC7300 on the QSO Today podcast. And now, back to our QSO today. So, do you operate a contest station? And, and if you do, what is the current rig? The current is a, a K3 uh, that has been modified to the level of a K3S. Uh, with, uh, do you run that barefoot, or do you run that with an amplifier? No, 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 no. I, uh, I run it with an amplifier. At the moment, I'm using a, a Maratron AL1500. I have uh, two other amplifiers, which are not working and they're being you know we're trying to get them fixed again and uh, the antennas are quite extensive uh, low frequency antennas uh, I have a, uh, a 54 foot vertical that has an antenna tuner at the base and it will work on 160 80 and 40 uh, it will also work at higher frequencies I found out and uh, then for 40 meters I have an eight element circle array that's eight verticals that are arranged in a circle and uh, they're used uh, four at a time uh, two fed in phase and two as reflectors and that covers all the directions of the, of the world you know just by turning a switch uh, and eventually i hope to expand that to include 80 meters and 160 by adding two more circles it will be three concentric circles i do i have to finish that up and then for receiving i have Beverage antennas of six directions. Uh, there, there's three bi-directional beverages that are a thousand feet long. Uh, fortunately, there's plenty of space out here. Uh, land was real cheap in this part of uh, the country, and, and I have 42 acres. So it used to be farmland, and people ask me what I grow, and I chuckle and tell them I grow, grow antennas. <laughs> so, uh huh. Yeah. Then, then I have a backup antenna, which isn't too serious, but it's good to have. Oh yes. I'm, for the rest of HF, I forgot I have a stepper uh, uh, four element uh, 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 Yagi. It's uh, on a 70, 72 or 75 foot crank up tower, and so that that fills in the complement for the for the other for the other bands. Um, I'm very, uh, I suppose, partial to, to the low frequencies, especially for one to 160 meters, which I, I did a great amount of work on in Israel, was probably the first. Uh, I'm sure it was the first uh, activity on 160 meters started from my station back in the early 80s. Now, do you still have a a, a house or or an apartment in Israel, and do you still operate from here? Yes, I have a, a house uh, in uh, a settlement called Naale, and uh, it has a uh, 100 foot rotating tower with a interlaced. Uh, 20 and 15 meter Yagi. That's an antenna that I designed and constructed myself. And above that, it has a rotary dipole for 40 meters. And on uh, 160 and 80 meters, there's half sloper antennas coming from the top of the tower, not the top of the tower, from below the Yagi uh, and going down towards the ground. And then also on uh, 160 and 80, I have a uh, Pennant antenna with a pre-selector, which is a which is an antenna that's only possible to use on, on receiving, but it's a uh, very low noise, very low signal to noise ratio, relatively. Uh, it, it enables me to hear on 11680 things that I would not hear if I was using the transmitting antennas. So uh, basically, all of the usual, not the WARC bands, but all of the usual bands I have there. I, oh, I do have the WARC band. I almost forgot. And then I have a second antenna. It's uh, 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 on a pipe mast on the house, and it's, it covers uh, uh, 40 meters up through 10 meters uh, 
with varying amounts of elements. Uh, so that, I can use that also. I can use that for oh. the URC maps too. Is it at the top of a hill? I mean, do you have Mediterranean view? Yes, it's at the top of the hill and standing out before they built the houses around me. But when I first moved in up there, standing in my front yard, I could look out and see ships on the Mediterranean uh, very clearly. And in the in the evening hours, I could look out towards uh, Ben Gurion Airport and actually count the, the lights on the edge of the landing strip. I could actually make them out individually. So. Uh, oh, oh I think I, I think I even know where you are then. Okay. You're above Khashmonaim on uh, up the hill there, right? Right, 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 right. To go, through, to go back and forth uh, or to anywhere from Nale, uh, where we pass through uh, the intersection of, uh, of, of Khashmonaim. That's true. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, great. Well, that sounds like a, a wonderful place. What, um, what kind of uh, rig are you operating there? My uh, transmitter there, my transceiver, it's... Uh, a Yesu FT-1000D, and um, the amplifier is a homebrew amplifier. It uses a 4PR-1000A. It's similar to a 4-1000A, except it's a, a much huskier tube. It has a solid graphite anode like, like you would find in an 813 and not, not these spot-welded things that develop hot spots. So it's, it's, it's an excellent amp. It, it, it's, uh, I never finished it, actually. I got it on the air, and it works up up through 20 meter. It goes in 160, 80, 40, and 20. And I, I never finished the uh, the, the RF uh, the, uh, tuning network so to get it up to 10 and 15. So on 10 and 15, I have a, a little Heathkit SB200 that I switch in, and, and I can use that on 10 and 15. Uh, now, as a contester, you're not operating uh, SO2R. You're still just operating one rig? Yeah, yeah. I've tried SO2V. Uh, single operator two VFOs uh, just recently, and uh, if I'm operating single band, there's it doesn't seem that there's really much advantage to it. Uh, a little bit maybe. Uh, I I'm still not convinced, uh, and I'm not convinced that I'm using it according to the techniques to, to use it. So the CQ uh, uh, worldwide will be coming up in, in a few days here, and and I'll be operating that as the K7NJ single band 40 meters. That simplifies everything tremendously, and I, I really enjoy that. And of course, uh, uh, assisted mode. I enjoy you know, using all the possible you know, things to, to to improve, you know, embellishments and things. Uh, uh, the reverse beacon network, and, and I have uh, uh, different devices here that I use that, that would reflect the uh, other. Uh, say what? What is that called? Uh, CW. Uh, I forget the name right now. <laughs> You'll have to block this out. <laughs> oh, these are these are the, the the networks that actually hear you um, hear you calling CQ and record your call sign and then put you up on the um, on the DX spotters. Yeah, but that in itself wouldn't be uh, considered uh, assisted unless I'm actually receiving the spots. In other words, like uh, it would re it would receive anybody, even people that are operating unassisted, would, uh, would put them up. Uh, but the uh, what I do, I have the spots coming down, and then those go into a band map. And, and uh, just with a, a simple combination of keys, I can go up and down the band map. map. I can look for, if I want to, just for look for new multipliers, or I can look for, for new, uh, for any station I haven't worked. And, uh, that's real handy. So I'll go back and forth between uh, CQ mode, and as long as the rate is staying up high, then I'll just stay there. And if the rate goes down, then I'll go to search and pounce, and also... Uh, when there's uh, a multiband uh, contest, especially and if there's parts of the world or rare stations, uh, then I will uh, uh, leave. Uh, uh, it causes a conflict. I'm deciding whether the, the, the rate in the CQ uh, mode is, is pretty good. So should I leave that and, and, and go look for some of these rare multipliers that I know the band is going to be open for right now? So that's an interesting thing that goes on in the background. Besides the operating, there's a lot of... Uh, consultation uh, inside of my brain trying to decide simultaneously while, uh, while, while making these contacts, trying to decide what to do uh, in, in operating mode. Should I be changing? Should I be going to a different band? Or what exactly should I be doing? So and that's, that's all part of it. And uh, it makes it very interesting, exciting, and challenging, and keeps the brain very, very active in, 
when we get older, it's important to keep our brain active. And uh, uh, competitive contesting like that certainly does a job. You probably have, what, done over 50 of the CQ Worldwides in your lifetime? Could be. I don't know how many. <laughs> uh, Do you change your strategy? Do you like to try something different with each contest? I change my strategy. I tailor it to the rules of the contest and what counts. Uh, so uh, that, that's it. Uh, but the, the, the background strategy that seems to be the underlying strategy for a lot of it is like I described, going back and forth between CQ mode and search and bounce mode. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. Do you operate the, um, the Cedar City uh, rig remotely when you're away no. from home? No, 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 no. I don't have, I don't have any of those, those remote capabilities. Although it's interesting. I've been following uh, what's being done there. and So much is easy now. And so many of these uh, uh, devices, uh, they're, they're just available off the shelf. For integrating the station and through the internet to be able to control it remotely. I, I know a lot of people are doing that, and uh, maybe I would do that someday. Well, it seems like it might be kind of fun to, to hear, um, you know, to, to take the remote control back to Nale and and uh, see if you hear yourself uh, in Cedar City from Israel. Probably would be able to. Uh, I, uh, There's remote SDR receivers all around the world. You could probably just as, more easily um, tune into one of those. Yeah, that's for sure. And I, I'm pretty sure that uh, uh, I wouldn't have any trouble hearing my station there. I, I've uh, arranged skids with uh, fellows in Cedar City when I'm in, in Israel. And, and they're just running very simple equipment, uh, like barefoot exciters and, and simple wire antennas no higher than 30 or 40 feet off the ground and was able to work them. So just depends on conditions, mainly, I think. Out of curiosity, because you work in, you know, in both places, what what does the noise floor look like in Israel compared to Cedar City? I would think that Cedar City is pretty quiet, but if we were trying to compare the noise floor in Israel to the noise floor in North America, do you think it's about the same, or do you, do you actually notice the differences? Well, it's uh, not a fair comparison because in the States, I live in a rural area, like I said, the, the 42 acres here, and and maybe in a radius of uh, three quarters of a mile, I only have three neighbors, and the closest is, is, is maybe a half a mile away. So uh, there's very little low noise. Occasionally, uh, I'll, I'll hear a click, 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 and it might be an electric fence. Uh, you know, and, and fortunately, that, that was off in the distance when I noticed that. And then uh, two miles away, there was a there was a, a, a little small little housing tract and. And I did notice a little bit of noise coming from there, but it was power line, and I contacted the power line company here, and they were very good, and they cleaned that up. So it's very, very quiet here in the States. On the other hand, in Israel, the settlement, uh, Nale, has built up, and there's a large number of families there now. When, when, when we moved in, we were uh, amongst the first settlers. It was 26 of us who went to the top of that hill. Uh, there was no road to speak of. Uh, everything was, was very rough. There was just one telephone uh, uh, for the whole settlement, and it was outside, and when it rained, uh, it was a problem to keep the rain off of you. And today, uh, uh, I was told there's about uh, 400 uh, families living there. So, uh, And the area around is built up. I used to have, uh, with permission, I could put beverages, beverages on ground, uh, commonly called uh, by its acronym BOG, Antennas. I had those going out for for 160 and 80 meters. And, uh, there's no way today. I mean, the, there's neighbors all over the place now, so that would be impossible. So, with uh, with people moving in close, you have all the typical noise that you would expect in, in houses, uh, light dimmers and all kinds of things. Uh, and and there, uh, I don't believe that we have the protection. Uh, uh, of receiving like we would have here in the States, the possibility of getting the FCC involved if necessary. Uh, but still, uh, I think if I did come up with anything, the neighbors would, would be cooperative. It shouldn't be a problem. Originally, uh, they were very excited and liked the idea of a ham station there uh, because uh, of the possibility of communicating with the rest of the country uh, via amateur radio. Like I said, we only had one uh, one tele one outside telephone for the whole settlement at one at one point 
But today, uh, everybody's got cell phones, you know, and that's gone by the wayside. So now, uh, some people are a bit leery about uh, the radiation from from uh, from amateur radio antennas uh, because of the big scare caused by the cell phone uh, situation. And then some of the newer people who moved in don't like this this uh, huge hundred foot tower on this relatively small lot uh, right next door to them or just down the street. They'd rather not see that, but then it was, it's been there forever. So they can't say they don't really approve of something that has been there forever, but they'd like to see it removed. And there's a little bit of pressure through the town council there to maybe see if they can get me to remove it, but uh, that's over with and it's gonna stay as far as I can tell. There won't be any, any, uh, any more attempts like that. So. Everything is, uh, is is good, but your question again about the relative noise, I, I really don't have a have any basis for comparing comparing the two because of what I described. No, but you actually answered the question, and, and and the reason I was asking is is because I don't think that we have like part fifteen here in Israel with regard to how cleanly electronic devices are that come from China or you know from other places. So. If you're like my neighborhood has a whole bunch of brand new LED street lights, and those switch mode power supplies that are up there um, make a hell of a racket, and I think you know there's there's no recourse, there's nobody to go to, you know, to to say hey, you know, all these power supplies they they make nice light, but they make a lot of noise. So that that you actually answered the question. That was kind of what I was wondering was whether whether or not. We're just, you know, noisier here than a, a similar suburban or urban area would be in North America. Yes, I think that would be true. You were a member of the uh, the three B six RFD expedition in two thousand one to uh, was it Agalega? Yes, Agalega. That's correct. Where is Agalega, and what was the biggest lesson that you learned from that trip? Agalega is in the Indian Ocean. It's a country that belongs to Mauritius, uh, which is a, you know, a much larger country. And, and to get there, we flew from uh, from Switzerland, where, where the whole group <laughs> got together. We flew to Mauritius, and then we flew uh, to uh, another group of islands. Hold on a second. Let's see. Looking up, yeah, the, Mal, the Maldives. We flew to the Maldives uh, from from the Seychelles, pardon me, from Mauritius, and uh, we had a small boat that took us all the way to uh, Agalega. It was a two-hour, pardon me, a two-day uh, ordeal. I I didn't have seasick medicine with me because uh, I had been on boats often before, and I never had a problem with, with, with these waves of uh, uh, they were so high and, and lasting for so long, I found out that I would eventually get seasick. <laughs> that was something, yeah. So seasick medicine might have been um, the, one of the first lessons you learned on that trip. It's my understanding that Amnon Bargiora, 4X1DF, who I mentioned earlier, who was interviewed in the QSO Today podcast in episode number eight. Amnon was a good friend and uh, agreed early on to be one of my first guests on the QSO Today podcast. Amnon also went with you, and what role did he play in that de-expedition? Amnon was one of two Uh, co-leaders. There was also a Swiss fellow. uh, I think his name was Hans Peter. I don't quite remember his call sign. Uh, But uh, Amnon... It seemed that the way they divided things up, Amnon took care of all of the organizational business aspects and all of this kind of thing. And the other fellow took care of the technical things, uh, uh, dealing with the actual putting up the, the antennas and the equipment and getting everything organized uh, on site and getting everything done. So uh, that, that was it. Amnon was uh, very much a leader of the, of the group in that sense. And now this message from QRP Labs. Well, Hans, G0UPL has done it again. QRP Labs announces a new 10-watt linear HF power amplifier kit for just $26 U.S. That's right, $26 United States currency. This power amplifier comfortably produces 10 watts from a 12-volt DC supply for every mode, including the high-duty cycle digital modes. 
This new linear amplifier provides 26 dB of gain from 2 to 30 MHz with a plus or minus 1 dB gain flatness over the entire range. This 10 watt HF linear power amplifier kit has no surface mount components to solder. There are a small number of transformers that need to be wound, and assembly requires care and patience. If you're a beginner, you can still do this kit. The push-pull driver stage uses two BS170 transistors in the amplifier found in the Softwalk transmitter design. This final uses two IRF510 transistors in push-pull configuration. Yes, this humble low-cost MOSFET is really capable of excellent performance all the way up to 10 meter band and beyond. Hans says the short lead lengths and PCB layout are extremely important to the success of this kit. This kit includes a huge heatsink to prevent overheating even during a 100% duty cycle. Hans sent me a message that he tested key down for one hour at 10 watts full power with no forced air cooling. He tested again for 15 minutes at 20 watts, 100% continuous duty cycle with no forced air cooling. He even tested this new power amplifier with a 20-volt DC power supply into an open load, a shorted load, and various mismatches without instability, oscillation, or failure. So if you have a QCX or any other QRP transmitter and want to boost its output power with a highly reliable linear power amplifier at an amazing price, then click on the link in this week's show notes page to tell hands that you heard it here on QSO Today. QRP Labs is my favorite kit company. It should be yours too. QRP Labs. And now back to our QSO. Did, have you done any other de-expeditions to exotic places? Maybe semi at the time to uh, Liechtenstein, HB0, XVR was my call, and to Andorra, uh, C31CL was the call sign there. That was, see what year was that? That would have been in 1969. Yeah, it was on the way, on the way back to Israel. Uh, uh, we decided to, my wife and, 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 and my son and I, we decided we'd stop in Europe on the way there. And we, we even bought a car and picked it up in, in Paris. And, and then we drove to these spots. And we had, it was a relatively compact car. It was a Renault uh, 10, which I don't think they even make anymore. And we had uh, my radio equipment, which, a generator, a 1KW generator, and all kinds of personal items. And, and of course, the ham equipment that I took with me which was my uh, Heathkit SB101 transceiver, an external VFO, and the power supply. And then uh, I was accompanied, uh, he was in a separate car, my very, very dear friend, uh, Mickey W7 uh, GVA Gulf Victor Alpha. Uh, and uh, we set up these two stations uh, uh, right next to each other. And it was pretty amazing, some of the, some of the things that happened there, really amazing. Especially from Andorra, uh, we were up on top of a, a mountain out in, uh, in, next to this uh, broadcast, uh, high-powered broadcast radio station that's heard all over Europe. So our vertical antennas were on the radio, um, had the advantage of having all these radials and all these different, uh, you know, passing by us, even though uh, we weren't connected to them. Uh, directly, still, I'm sure that we were re re reflecting off of them, and uh, we were told by stations in the states that we weren't real strong, that we were consistently there. The band wasn't open to anywhere else in Europe; they could hear us all the time, just about. So that was an amazing uh, experience. Uh, we camped out there at night, uh, right there. It was pretty cold, uh, and uh, there were no facilities up there. We had a uh, our bag of of water and it was really roughing it, but we were sitting in the cars uh, where, where, where we were able to drive up, up, up out on the top of the field. Up, on, pardon me, out on the top of the antenna site there for the for the radio station, for the commercial radio station. So was, that was a lot of fun, and uh, all the, always remember that. A lot of nice slides that it took at the time too. Now you say your your wife and your son were along with you. Were they pretty supportive of your ham radio pastime? <laughs> Well, my son was only about five years old at the time, so he didn't really understand too much about it. And uh, my wife uh, uh, was, uh, yeah, she was okay with it. Did she become a ham radio operator herself? No, no, she never did. She, you know, was uh, 
there was never a problem. I know that some sometimes families, some people have problems with their spouse uh, not liking the hobby, and never did have a problem like that. And she was uh, supportive in that sense that she just let me do my thing, and she was happy that I was happy, and that was it. What is the Rainbow Canyons Amateur Radio Club? That's the uh, local radio club of Cedar City, Utah. And is it active? And I mean, are you recruiting new members to amateur radio through it? Yes, it's, very, it's a very active club. Uh, the la- they have a monthly meeting. The last meeting, there was about 35 or 40 people there. Um, and every every month, uh, the meetings, besides a typical club-type business, uh, there's always uh, somebody giving a presentation of a sort. Uh, uh, actually, last, last meeting, I gave a presentation on abbreviations used in ham radios, uh, which uh, a lot of the newcomers uh, found uh, very useful. And uh, they also give classes uh, for people who are interested in ham radio to get them prepared for the exams. And then uh, we have a coordinator who uh, coordinates the, uh, the license exams and uh, volunteer examiners, uh, uh, of course, uh, handle that. I, I happen to be a volunteer examiner also. One way of giving a little bit back to ham radio that has given me so much throughout the years. Are you also a home brewer? Even uh, still? Yeah, that's it's sort of funny. When I started out in ham radio, I had all of this enthusiasm about building things, et cetera, and no knowledge. <laughs> and now after all these years of my education and experience and all, the knowledge is there, uh, but I don't particularly enjoy building for the pleasure of building. I, I will uh, home brew things, uh, you know, in order to, to improve my, my station to make it function better, or little gadgets and things that I might add on. So that's uh, that's what it, where it is today. Now, one of your strengths is antenna design, and you were talking about your your verticals out in your uh, back forty. Are those of your design? Uh, the the four element circle array is is, is the design of uh, Allen K seven Charlie Alpha. Uh, what I've done is adapted that to a, 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 a three band forty eighty one sixty concentric circle design and. Uh, I haven't completed the 80 and 160 part yet, although the, the radials are all out. There's over 20 miles of, of, of copper radials out of the ground out there, and the basis for the, for the verticals are there. The controls and everything in the shack are, 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 are completed, and then uh, you know, once the uh, other uh, antenna elements are placed out there with, with, the, with the matching boxes of the base, uh, I'll be able to control those. So. Uh, the basic design, the idea of how to connect these verticals, but to have the base, the length of the, of the verticals, the basic RF design of, of a single band, uh, a circle array like that is, uh, again, is by Allen in our case of NCA, and, and then I've adapted that. Other other antennas that I have out here, the single element, 160, 80, 40, I did the antenna tuner on that, and that was a real challenge getting it to work on 80 meters because it's basically half wave res- resonant on uh, on 80 meters, and uh, that puts a high voltage point at the base. And to try and feed that with uh, one kW, pardon me, one and a half kW, uh, it caught all kinds of problems with voltage breakdown and getting getting high voltage components to work there, and, uh, that that sort of thing. So that was a big challenge. I got that working okay, and it's been working for a number of years now with no problem at all. The beverages are. Uh, Designed, uh, they're a little bit unique. They have instead of they're, they're bi-directional. I have three wires, a thousand feet long each, covering all the important directions. They're bi-directional. And the usual technique is to uh, have one collapse, one pardon me, one feed line going out to the to the beverage and then uh, doing something at the opposite end uh, to be able to reverse the direction. What I have is a, a transformer, the toroid transformer, at each end of the beverage. And then I have coax coming all the way back to the shack. And then uh, either end of the beverage, uh, if I wanted to use a particular wire, uh, it's either a, an end of that of, the, of that uh, wire goes to the receiver, or uh, that same coax could be terminated in a 50 ohm load, and then the other end could be used. So I'm switching between coaxes is what I'm doing, and I don't have any uh, anything that I'm doing. Uh, out of the antenna itself, uh, involving any relays or any kind of uh, phasing networks or any, anything more complicated. It's, it's very simple. It uh, requires a lot of coax, but fortunately, 
that was a gift from my boss uh, and a very dear friend uh, where I used to work uh, and some in uh, Japan whiskey, Jim Wilson. So, uh, ah, ah, okay. Good. That's, that leads me to one of my questions. You were a senior electrical engineer for Wilson Electronics. And I think, if I recall, Wilson Electronics used to make, make ham radio gear. Yes. Do you remember that? Yes, a long, 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 long time ago. A long time ago. They used to make a like a VHF handheld, as I recall. That's true. And, uh, uh, Jim had several companies. I'm not sure how the names were. I'm, I think at one time it was Wilson at, uh, Antennas. I'm really not sure of the names, though. And, and, and he... Uh, at, at that time, sold a uh, sold some some interesting antennas. Some were even shown in the antenna handbook uh, some years ago. Right. Okay, I remember. But you were the senior electrical engineer for Wilson Electronics, and they are now makers of cellular telephone boosters. Yes. For those of us who live in poor cellular areas, do these uh, devices actually work? And do they work wide? And would you advise someone that has poor or to no cellular telephone coverage in their home or office to get one? Would suggest they consider one. If you don't, if you don't have any cellular signal whatsoever, then there's nothing, nothing you can amplify and nothing you can improve upon. Then you won't have an improvement. But generally, in rural areas, it makes a big difference. A, a friend of mine lives very, very far out, away from, from from Cedar City, almost on the border between Utah and Nevada. And uh, I, I got him a a, a Wilson uh, uh, amplifier, and installed it and now he has completely reliable uh, cell phone coverage when before it was very very spotty only on certain times of day and only when he stood in certain places in his house or outside could he have any coverage and, and, and that was affected by the weather too now it's completely normal any time of day any any weather uh, no problem at all and he has uh, uh, just excellent coverage at the time at, at this time so ricky if you had pretty good coverage on top of the roof, but you had no service inside the house, what do you think about a, a passive antenna system in terms of you know, a lot of gain on the antenna point at the cell site, hard line to uh, an antenna inside? Is there enough signal that could be put into a house without having to have an active element? Probably not. There's a, a factor when you, it doesn't convert directly when you convert it to what amounts to a signal on the coax. So there's a Factor if you look at the, at the formula for that, if I remember right, the number something like 36 dB that gets mm -hmm. that you're involved with. And, and anyway, it, 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 that's been tried, and I know that before I joined the company, <clears throat> they they did try something like that, uh, and I don't believe uh, that there was uh, any success with that because of that. I see, but these devices are bi-directional amplifiers, then, right? Yes, yes, they must be bi-directional, uh, or they won't function properly with the with the cell site. Oh, interesting. Okay. Here in Israel, there are places, uh, because we build with cement and steel instead of wood and drywall, there's oftentimes you've got piece, places in your house where you don't have any cellular telephone coverage at all, although it might be fine in the yard. Yeah. Well, it, 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 I don't know if it could go through a concrete wall, like in a, a sheltered room, which, which would be a reinforced steel or a concrete you know, it might have trouble penetrating that, but normally drywall and anything like that is practically transparent. No problem getting through. Right. And I know that in Israel, the, the some of this, I'm not sure which of the cell phone companies, but I know that the, the uh, contractor who was building the houses in LA had, uh, had a booster in his office, and that was obtained directly from one of the cell phone companies there. Here in Israel, they're licensed. You actually have to license these uh, amplifiers. You can't buy them off the shelf. Right, right. And they would be installed by, by the Israeli uh, company that was operating this, the cell system. Right, exactly. What excites you the most about what's happening in amateur radio now? What excites me the most is a lot of the new techniques and things that are, that are growing up that I'm reading about, like FT8 and I need to get involved in, 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 in those things. I, I, I'm following it a little bit. And I've got, got some books, and I really have to make my station uh, work on that. And I'm not active in DXing as I'm not sending in any cards or anything, but I enjoy still working all of these uh, rare uh, de-expeditions, uh, getting in the pileups and seeing how I'm able to get through, you know, that kind of thing. That's still a lot of fun, but I will not be applying for any DFCC credits. 
But you could because you've been there and done that already. Well, I've been there and done that, and I would continue with it, but I didn't have to start over again from here. Do you think that if you've won the XCC and you've you've done it, but then you move to a new QTH, is there that incentive to do it all over again just to see if you can do it all over again with the new rig and the new antenna farm and the new QTH? Well, actually, just to achieve basic DXCC, which is 100 countries, is uh, no challenge at all. You could do that easily in one contest weekend uh, with, with, with even an average station. Uh, the challenge is to get up to the honor roll and, 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 of course, to get to the very top of the honor roll is the ultimate challenge. So it, I think it's entirely a personal thing. And for me, the trade-off is between the, the bureaucracy and the paperwork and, and all that kind of business and, and the actual fun of operating. So uh, unless you follow follow up with the paperwork and the logbook on the, on, of the world, if you're using that, and if you want to bother with all of that, unless you do that, you're not actually going to be getting any DXCC credits, but you would know yourself what you've accomplished, and, 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 and that's fun. And I know uh, several hams who, who are just, just like that. They, they have worked a tremendous amount of, uh, of countries, but they've never even applied for DXCC. What advice would you give to newer returning hams to the hobby? Uh, to visit several stations uh, that are, are known to be uh, advanced and, and, and uh, active and, and doing the kind of activity that you're interested in, whether it, it could be DXing, of course, or contesting, or it might be uh, just doing VHF work or, or, or digital, or uh, perhaps uh, uh, your interest is, is in emergency communications, which is great, and things of that sort. So find out uh, who has, is relatively accomplished, who has a good station in those areas, and, and visit one of them. And by the way, uh, emergency communications, the VHF, which I don't have a, a, an interest in uh, because I, I, I just don't get involved in those things and they, they really don't attract me. I, I'm very supportive of that because only because of emergency communications that are handled by radio amateurs in emergency situations, only because of that we receive the, the recognition and the support of our hobby in general. And because of, of, of the great accomplishments in the area of emergency communications, I'm able to enjoy contesting. If, if not for accomplishments in emergency communications, I'm sure that our frequencies who are coveted uh, uh, by a commercial interest, would eventually we'd lose them all and, and the, the whole on the air part of amateur radio would, uh, would not exist in probably several tens of years from now. But because of emergency communications and, and our accomplishments and work in that area, we are, uh, are able to enjoy all these other aspects. So I highly encourage anybody in amateur radio to, to give full support to that activity. Well, I think there seems to be no shortage of emergencies uh, these days in, in the United States and, and around the world, you know, where amateur radio operators are playing a role. You know, hopefully that in reinforces in the minds of the general public that uh, amateur radio is valuable. But I, I guess I don't see, I mean, I see the amateur radio press, but I don't see the, the, that the regular press carries very much uh, amateur radio coverage. Are you seeing something different there? Uh, yeah, I do. I've noticed it, but probably because I'm looking for it and, uh, on uh, accounts of, of amateur radio uh, being the, the sole source of communications. It, it could be uh, given a lot more attention than it is, but I, I, I certainly have noticed it. Ricky, you've been a, a fine guest. I really am happy that we finally got a chance to connect. We've been working on it for a long time, and the stars lined up, and we're now talking. So I really appreciate your joining me on the QSO Today podcast. And with that, I want to wish you 73. Okay, yeah, Eric, it's been my pleasure, too. I wish you also 73, and very, very happy holidays coming up soon. Enjoy. That concludes this episode of QSO Today. I hope that you enjoyed this QSO with Ricky. Be sure to check out the show notes that include links and information about the topics that we discussed. Go to www.qsotoday.com and put in K7NJ in the search box at the top of the page. 
My thanks to both ICOM America and QRP Labs for their support of the QSO Today podcast. Please show your support of these fine sponsors by clicking on their links in the show notes pages or when you make your purchases that you say that you heard it here on QSO Today. You may notice that some of the episodes are transcribed into written text. If you'd like to sponsor this or any of the other episodes into written text, please contact me. Support the QSO Today podcast by first joining the QSO Today email list by pressing the subscribe buttons on the show notes pages. I will not spam you or share your email address with anyone. Become a listener sponsor monthly or annually by clicking on the sponsor buttons on the show notes page. I am grateful for any way that you show appreciation and support. It makes a big difference. QSO Today is now available on iHeartRadio, Spotify, Libsyn, and TuneIn, as well as the iTunes Store. If you own an Amazon Echo, you can say, B, play the QSO Today podcast from TuneIn. I still use Stitcher to listen to podcasts on my smartphone. The links to all of these services are on the show notes pages on the right side. Until next time, this is Eric for Z1UG 73. The QSO Today podcast is a product of KEG Media Inc., who is solely responsible for its content.